Thank you all for joining us this afternoon as we open these two uh, wonderful exhibitions. I'm grateful as always to work with the talented CMA staff here uh, in mounting these shows. I want to especially acknowledge the curatorial department um, who helped support the logistics, um, the beautiful hang, uh, the wall colors, uh, the label process, all of that and everything that you see there uh, is really thanks in th to them. I echo Della's thanks to our sponsors, and I also wish to acknowledge the uh, generous lenders to Interior Lives. Some of, us, some of them are joining us here tonight, or this afternoon. Uh, 15 museums, foundations, private collectors from our region and beyond all contributed artwork to this exhibition and really made it sing on the walls, and I'm deeply grateful for that. Interior Lives is a thematic exhibition uh, exploring the dawn of modernism in America through the lenses of interior scenes, uh, painted interiors, portraiture, still life, genre scenes, and similar, um, as well as decorative arts and design. The social and political histories of that period, the late Gilded Age through World War II, uh, really serve as the backdrop for these artworks uh, that instead explore quotidian life and everyday experience in America. We do, in this exhibition, seek to shine spotlights um, on various aspects of American life. It is by no means a comprehensive show, um, but I think the backbone of the exhibition deals with class and sort of attendant um, and related concerns uh, concerning race, uh, region, gender, and beyond. The basis of the presentation is drawn from the CMA's permanent collection. Uh, I'm showing two examples here. You'll find this wonderful painting by Raphael Sawyer, which came into our uh, collection in 1998, is featured on our title wall uh, with a beautifully and newly restored frame. Um, this work was chosen to orient the presentation because in many ways it sums up the show's conceit. Uh, it demonstrates the ways that artists and everyday people explore and synthesize change through that which is most familiar to them. It's titled Entering the Studio, and the painting is in fact a portrait of Sawyer's wife, Rebecca. She's peering into her husband's home studio um, in this sort of spare New York interior, uh, awash in the yellow glow of an unseen lamp, indicating that Sawyer is probably working into the night. It's painted around 1935, so amidst the Depression in New York. And the suggestion, of course, is one of Sawyer's vocation as an artist uh, amidst deep financial hardship. It is a beautiful example of a realist painter's ability to reflect the outside world uh, through the inside world. The historical parameters for our show are roughly, again, 1890 to 1945. Uh, so we're considering the 1890s really as a starting point for the progressive uh, social reform movements. Uh, in 1890, the Danish-American photographer Jacob Rees published uh, his famous expose on the squalid living conditions of uh, recent immigrants to New York, uh, famously titled How the Other Half Lives. Thereafter, following uh, this publication, we see plenty of literature in the ensuing decades dealing with similar topics. I'm thinking of uh, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair in 1906. Uh, Maggie, A Girl of the Streets by Stephen Crane in 1893. Um, these, progress these progressive ideals uh, folded, of course, into the movement for women's suffrage uh, at this time, and many of those uh, ideals are referenced throughout works in the show in subtle ways. Uh, so activists like Reese really made clear the profound disparity in wealth and class uh, that typified the Gilded Age. At the same time, immigrants were flooding into America, mostly coming through New York Harbor. Uh, industrialists like Andrew Carnegie, Henry Clay, Henry Clay Frick uh, were sort of the original 1%, right? The an enormous uh, amount of wealth. In our first gallery, Contra Reese, we're calling it How the Upper Half Lives. Uh, we've hung this wonderful painting by William Merritt Chase, which shows the interior of a residence called Oak Manor. Uh, which was occupied by H.K. Porter, who was the owner of the H.K. Porter Locomotive Manufacturing Company. Uh, Chase, of course, was the go-to society painter of the 19th century. So if you had the means, um, you commissioned Chase to paint your portrait. We actually have two examples in the CMA's collection, uh, one of which is on view upstairs in Gallery 9 uh, of prominent Columbians. But in this case, interestingly, interestingly, Porter commissioned Chase to paint the interior of his home. Um, which I think echoes and exemplifies the phenomenon of conspicuous consumption, um, an idea coined by Thorsten Veblen in the same year, 1899, uh, that this picture was painted. 
Uh, Chase dutifully emphasizes the expansiveness of the estate using this tilted perspective. In the background, we see uh, a pair of suits of armor um, sort of flanking what must have been a beautiful sitting room. Um, Porter actually built an annex on the property that housed his own art gallery, which must have been quite nice. Um, and his interest in art and the fact that he commissioned Chase to paint a portrait of his home really does suggest a kind of link between objects and personas in this period, which is a theme that runs through our exhibition. At right, paired with this in our gallery is a jewel of a painting by Walter Gay, a Massachusetts-born artist um, who certainly was born into a family of means, but he married even better. So he married Matilda Travers, who was a, uh, the daughter of an extraordinarily wealthy uh, New York banker. Uh, most importantly for Gay, um, this enabled him to travel uh, in Europe and to reside in France, uh, in Paris, and, and outside uh, for the remainder of his life. And once he marries Matilda, he decides to turn his, uh, his subject mostly to uh, interiors. So he painted um, the interior of, of his own homes, as well, notably, of the interior of some friends and colleagues of the social um, elite in Paris, including uh, Edith Wharton, uh, the novelist who was actually probably most famous for co-authoring a book called The Decoration of Houses in 1897. Uh, it functioned really as the prototypical manual for interior design. So this was a moment in the 1890s and the early 20th century uh, where interior design is kind of founded as a discipline. And in our show, we have several examples um, of ephemera. House Beautiful was a magazine, uh, House and Garden as well. Uh, all of these kind of outlining um, as a response to the Gilded Age, uh, nouveau riche mansions, which Edith Wharton and uh, her colleagues kind of felt were uh, overwrought a bit, um, brimming with ornaments and patterns and just a bit too much. So Wharton was kind of foreshadowing what would become uh, the early 20th century modernist aesthetic. Uh, the 19th century is also a time when the United States is actively uh, and very self-consciously kind of identifying itself, um, thinking about what America means. So you think in art movements of the earlier 19th century, the Hudson River School, of course, is the first painterly movement that uh, gains prominence on the, na on the international stage. Um, this is also a time, and, and we're proud to say they're represented in our galleries, uh, where significant American manufacturers, Gorham Silver, uh, Seth Thomas, the clock manufacturing, uh, Lennox as well, all of these uh, organizations are founded in the 19th century. Uh, so America is still looking to Europe for inspiration, and just about every artist in our show studied in Europe um, to varying degrees, except for George Bellows, of course. Um, but very much folks are beginning to look inward, and this wonderful uh, painting by Cecilia Bow kind of speaks to that. Um, this is, the sitter is a Connecticut-based lawyer named George Dudley Seymour, uh, and Bo paints him in this oversized green riding cloak. In fact, the painting is called The Green Cloak, dating to 1925. Seymour maintained that this cloak dated to the 18th century, to the period of the American Revolution. Uh, so Seymour was a self-styled uh, historian. He was a lay historian, an author of books, um, and uh, an antiquarian himself. Uh, notably, he was a promoted, proponent of the Revolutionary War hero, the Patriot Nathan Hale, and he uh, authored a biography on Nathan Hale as well. Uh, and several of Seymour's books, of course, were vanity publications. Um, Beau depicts Seymour uh, also you know, in, uh, al alongside attributes that serve to identify uh, Seymour and align him with the sort of traditional uh, historical American lineage. Um, he's sitting before uh, a writing desk. He has a, a couple of folios in front of him suggesting that he's perhaps deep in research, a couple of books which he may have authored himself, and these two candles. Um, and for, uh, for someone of Seymour's means in 1925 in New Haven, it would be unlikely that he'd be working from candlelight, uh, as by this time, uh, electric light had more or less uh, occupied the major cities in America. But again, it serves to link Seymour to this historical lineage, right? I mentioned conspicuous consumption. Uh, in the early 20th century, we can sort of think about what it meant to have uh, a Seth Thomas clock. And we have this great example of a crystal regulator model dating to about 1910 in the first gallery. 
Um, so what did it mean to have a crystal regulator uh, in your home by Seth Thomas? And then what did it mean in 1906 for Columbia uh, to commission not one but two Seth Thomas clocks uh, for Main Street? And of course, I'm showing the one here uh, that's just across the street at Sylvan uh, Jewelry Store, but, uh, which I'm sure many of you have walked by many times. Um, it is still, I'm told, functional, and it is still uh, working on its original mechanical means and requires winding every so often as well. So we can think about what it was for Columbia in the early 20th century, uh, sort of identifying itself and aligning in it itself with the New South, perhaps competing with Atlanta uh, in some regard. And I think this is kind of really exciting to think about. Moving into the second gallery, we have some representations of labor, uh, juxtaposed, of course, with the owners of the means of production in the first gallery. Uh, and in factories like this one, uh, the Duff Norton plant, which was located in Pittsburgh, um, we have a firsthand rendering kind of of the harsher conditions uh, of manufacturing and what that really entailed. Uh, the painter is Otto August Kuhler, a German-American painter based in Pittsburgh. Um, Duff Norton were manufacturers of mechanical parts. Uh, I think they patented a lathe, and they were, uh, especially at this time, manufacturing lots of lifting jacks, which were made in the construction of railways across America. Uh, the painting is on loan from the Westmoreland Museum of Art in Pennsylvania. I think it's actually a jewel of a painting. It, it warrants close looking, and I encourage you to look at it in the galleries. I think the contrast of colors really invokes the sense of heat, uh, dynamism. Uh, one gets a sense of the smoke as well. At upper left, I'm showing this detail of the ceiling armature, uh, which to me reads like uh, a pentagram. Uh, maybe the painter alluding to something of the esoteric nature of turning raw materials uh, into something that is deeply modern, uh, deeply contemporary, uh, and also very functional. So. Uh, this sort of esoteric view, maybe uh, a look at the factory worker uh, as a sorcerer, as a sorcerer, a contemporary sorcerer. Very different kind of setting here. Um, this from, from our own region, uh, on kind loan from the Johnson Collection in Spartanburg. It's a wonderful painting uh, made in a regionalist mode by the painter Winona Bell. Uh, an important subtext here, of course, is the greater entry of women in the workforce uh, that attended uh, the First and Second Wars and in between as well. Uh, and along with that, a renewed cultural assessment of gendered roles uh, in, the workforce, in the workforce and beyond. You also get a sense, I think, in this painting, really of the mechanization uh, of the world at this time as America was coming out of what's been called the Second Industrial Revolution. Um, the mechanization that enabled mass consumption, uh, the impact, of course, on the assembly line and industries all across America, including the agricultural industry, which you get a sense of here. Uh, so the, we have uh, crates stacked at eye level in these metal chutes, and you can imagine the women sort of pulling the crates down, uh, picking the peaches, filling them, uh, filling the crates, turning around, handing them off to their colleague, who would then bring it outside, probably load it into a truck. Uh, we have a system of pilly, pulleys, you can see at left, uh, bringing baskets, presumably filled with peaches, and they would dump the baskets in this sort of uh, mechanized machine age dance, right? Um, also, the figure at right in the immediate foreground, um, and it's been interpreted this way, uh, does seem to have a more androgynous experience, um, appearance, rather, which is a suggestion, I think, uh, commenting on the shifting gender roles at this time. Uh, this piece painted in 1920. This is the same year that the 19th Amendment was ratified. It's a charming painting by Garrett Benneker. Uh, again, indicating the widespread use of the telephone. Um, the telephone had been invented you know, a few decades prior, but by the 1920s, it really uh, had populated into urban environments and connected people in a new way. Um, switchboard operators uh, in this period were, uh, it was a role primarily occupied by women. Uh, and here the artist depicts this young woman with an air of real self-confidence and I think agency. Uh, she is responsible for manipulating the machine. And to my mind, that dash of white paint on her uh, left hand at the pinky uh, is suggestive of a pinky ring, which at that time would have been a quiet symbol promoting women's rights and women's independence uh, in the modern period. The portrait of Sue Bailey, it's called Miss Bailey with the African shawl. Um, by Edwin Harlson. It's another example, sort of, of an artist signaling culture uh, by sartorial means. So Bailey was a traveling secretary for the YWCA in New York. 
Uh, she visited Harleston's studio in Charleston in 1930, uh, which gave uh, occasion for Harleston and also his wife, Elise Forrest, who was a, a noted photographer, uh, to render her portrait. Um, Harleston was uh, an African-American artist. He studied at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Uh, and following uh, his experience there, he decided to come back to Charleston. Uh, and this was in the 19-teens. And he was really sort of... Um, frustrated with uh, and the enormous racial tensions that were happening in that decade, really since the time, only a few years since the time that he had left. Uh, and this culminated in a, a race riot in 1919, which was deadly. Uh, and as a response to this, Harleston uh, dug in. He set up shop with his wife. He set up a, port he set up a portrait studio uh, for the benefit of African-American community members. And he painted several prominent African-Americans. Um, but he also was the founding president of the Charleston chapter of the NAACP and was active in, in numerous uh, related causes. Uh, and so you see here, uh, again, the painting is titled uh, Miss Bailey with the African Shawl, but it's been suggested and noted by scholars that there's nothing particularly African about the garment that Miss Bailey is wearing. Um, and so it's been proposed that this is a way for Harleston uh, to link himself um, and by extension to link his sitter to the burgeoning New Negro aesthetics, aesthetic movement, uh, which was happening uh, with kind of a younger generation of artists, including Aaron Douglas at this time. So Harleston himself uh, was working in a somewhat more traditional mode of representation, um, but he still sort of expressed solidarity for this new uh, definitively African-American uh, aesthetic experience. We have several still lifes in the show. Uh, in Gallery 3, we present these, again, under the rubric of objects and personas, two wonderful examples that really drive home, to my mind, uh, the broader idea of what, what it meant to paint a still life really since antiquity, uh, the relationship and the tension between presence and absence, and rendered here in both examples through a really modernist idiom, in my view. Uh, Yasuo Kuniyoshi's Still Life of 1928, uh, and at right we have Teresa Pollock's uh, art studio painted three years later. Um, and both of them reference um, the absence of the figure in very direct ways. Of course, in Kuniyoshi's example, we have um, a wardrobe uh, left ajar at left, showing uh, a beautiful coat. And then at right, um, we have Teresa Pollock uh, showing a three-quarter length uh, plaster bust uh, sitting on the windowsill. And I think I do read both of these pictures through uh, maybe the, the overwrought idea of the sense of urban isolation, right? The kind of modernist familiar trope that as city, cities built up, uh, which they did to an incredible degree at this time, uh, and people were becoming more and more uh, closer together uh, physically, uh, that there was some kind of psychological distance um, that was created uh, amidst this urban environment. Uh, and interestingly, Kuniyoshi's painting in New York, um, and Teresa Pollock was painting in Richmond in 1931. Uh, and while Richmond is not a place in the 1930s that we think of as an extraordinarily um, urban, uh, in fact, we get a sense of um, her environment uh, by looking through the window. Uh, Pollock seems to be on the second or third story. Um, in this sort of sparse uh, apartment interior. Um, we see roof, the roof line there is very evident as well as a water tower. So I think if I told you that this was painted in Brooklyn like Red Hook or something, you'd probably believe me. Um, and it suggests to me the shared experience uh, of Pollock and Kuniyoshi. Okay. In the same gallery, um, and pa sort of paired with the Pollock, Aesthetically, we're looking at the clean geometric lines and making a case between uh, Pollock's painting uh, and the decorative arts and design that were um, burgeoning at this period in the 20s and the 30s and into the 40s. Uh, modernist design, frankly. Uh, so gone are, the, gone are those sort of ornate and elaborate um, interiors of the Gilded Age uh, that were bedecked with patterns and uh, artworks, you know, pulled from Europe and European sources. Uh, now we sort of have a design aesthetic that is very much met with uh, the idea of form follows function um, and that is really appropriate for the machine age and the way that people are living uh, in this period. Um, the new economy that was burgeoning at this time that was given rise by mass production and consumer culture really takes over that Gilded Age idea about uh, character moving from the cult of character, where one defined oneself in the world with a strong sense of moralism, uh, 
giving way to sort of the cult of personality or individualism, which I think is something we're much more familiar with today. Um, and so in Saarinen's Grasshopper Chair, um, at Wright, we, uh, it was produced by Knoll uh, just after the war, uh, and Saarinen himself, when asked about what, how he came up with the design, noted that he created it for post-war Americans who like to slouch. Again, sort of dealing with this idea um, of making objects for the ways people were living and, and moving through the world. Uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright, um, you know, absolutely um, took that charge to new heights in his development of the Usonian homes, um, open living spaces created to accommodate uh, the needs of the modern family. Uh, so I recently watched uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, I felt that it dragged on a bit, frankly. I think it will probably, probably lose to Oppenheimer. Um, but nevertheless, I was pleased um, with a scene uh, in the film where President Calvin Coolidge is sort of depicted as an advocate for native causes, which was true, and it was very much um, topical in the 1920s. Uh, so in 1924, uh, Coolidge ratified the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted citizenship granted U.S. citizenship for the first time to Native Americans. Um, and two years later, um, this picture by Walter Ufer was painted in 1926. Um, so, of course, the film also suggests that the topic of Native affairs remained a, a very charged one uh, in the 1920s. Um, in the art world, we had a group of white artists, uh, frankly, who moved uh, from all disparate parts of the country and descended on Taos, New Mexico, and their interest uh, was in painting Native American life. Uh, in Ufer's case, we have this incredible, uh, really jewel of a painting on loan from the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa. Um, it's called The Listeners, um, and inside we see uh, Ufer depicting a family of Puebloans um, listening to um, a white pianist, who was probably Ufer's wife, uh, playing for them. Uh, the scene is, of course, uh, an adobe construction, a sort of traditional New Mexico construction um, in terms of the home itself, and it was probably Ufer's studio. We get a sense that um, Ufer's paintings and artworks are lying around in this syncretic and, and dynamic relationship along with objects drawn from local indigenous populations. Uh, so, you know, one can only wonder um, at Ufer's motivations here, it's been talked about. Uh, I do think it speaks to kind of Ufer's anxiety um, concerning perhaps cultural assimilation uh, in light of the Indian Citizenship Act. Uh, if you look closely at the painting, um, none of the figures are actually sharing eye contact and there is a real sense of tension that seems linked to a clash of cultures. Okay, the exhibition kind of concludes um, with this work by Milton Avery from the Terra Foundation in Chicago. Uh, the, city, the sitter is Avery's daughter, March, uh, and uh, March Avery, last I checked, is still living and is actually um, a well-regarded and accomplished painter in her own right. Um, but this was painted at a time when March was in her early teen years, probably 14 or 15 or so, uh, and she's presented as if amidst a growth spurt. Uh, those gangly teen years, right, that we probably wish to forget. Uh, her limbs are kind of exaggerated. She, she seems too large for the furniture on which she, she's sitting. Um, and in fact, her feet are jutting out of the frame at bottom right. Um, and I do think that this is a metaphor uh, for America in 1947. Uh, at this moment uh, in the post-war period where America achieves such cultural and economic dominance on the world stage that had really never uh, been achieved before. Um, and I do, I, I love this painting for a variety of reasons, but also because it really uh, demonstrates um, Avery as a modernist uh, working in a realist, in a representational manner, uh, even despite abstract expressionism becoming um, the de rigueur artwork of the time, by 1947 in New York especially. Um, so it, it serves to sum up our show because also in a way it demonstrates uh, the ways that artists who worked in a representational style uh, kind of uniquely synthesize their world around them um, through a very um, unique idiom that was contrary to the art, the artists that would come, the Americans that would come after it, right, in abstract expressionism, uh, which is perhaps fodder for another exhibition.